Agile, you say yo. When I say agile, you say yo. Agile. Yo. Agile. Yo. When I say yo, you say agile. When I say yo, you say agile. Yo. Agile. Yo. Agile. <laughs> So I want to make sure everyone's comfortable. This is a long talk. Everyone's comfortable? Yeah. Okay. So just everyone stand up. Okay. So who here knows how to play rock, paper, scissors? Okay, will you be a volunteer? Sure. Okay, so we're going to teach everyone how to play rock, paper, scissors. Do you want to explain it? Well, the way I usually do it, you do like a count of three, and then on three, you display either rock, paper, or scissors, and I guess the, the hierarchy, rock uh, gets conquered by paper, paper gets conquered by scissors, and scissors gets conquered by rock. Okay, great. Let's just do a couple just to show. Okay, okay. okay. All right. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Okay, and so she wins because the rock hammers the scissors, okay? So you, yeah, let's do it. Boom, okay, so just one more. One, two, three. Okay, now it's a tie. Okay, everyone get it? Any questions? Okay. Suggestion. Suggestion. I think it's more fair if you already have your hands forward because you can kind of see if someone already opens up while wow. reaching and you can cheat. Oh, interesting. So you just want to go like this and then go like that? No, so you do it like... One, two, three. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay, great. We have an improvement. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Okay, so you can... Thank you so much. I can even... Just big round of applause for her. Oh. Okay, awesome. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Okay, you're going to pair up and you're going to play best of three. Okay, now, if you lose, you automatically become a fan of the person who won, right? So you're like, if, let's say that Larry and I play, right, and Larry beats me, yes. then I become his fan. So I'm going, Larry, 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 okay? And then he finds someone else okay. to play against. And then if he wins again, then both of us become his fan. Larry, 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 Larry. So we keep going. Okay? And we keep going until there are two people left. And then the two people left will come up here and we'll have the championship of job hackers. Okay? Let's do it. Go ahead.
stops by, says, what's going on? The man says, oh, I need help. Can you help me? And the doctor looks down and says, well, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. <laughs> and this guy takes two aspirin, headache goes away, still in the hole. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Right? A whole bunch of people walk by. A lawyer stops, says, you know, what's going on? He says, well, I'm down in this hole. The lawyer says, wow, I'm outraged. How can there be holes in the middle of the city? Let me go sue the city. <laughs> and then once the city accepts culpability, we'll fix the hole. Right? And finally, this crazy person stops by and uh, help me, help me, help me. Crazy person jumps in and says, what are you doing here? The crazy guy says, uh, well, I've been here before and we'll get out together. <laughs> <laughs> So this person, you know, gets out of the hole, he's living life, and he's somewhat disturbed by this situation. Right? All these people walked by, didn't help him, trying to figure out the meaning of life. And so the person starts asking people, like, what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? Finally, the person's told, well, so up on this mountain, there's this wise person who knows the answer. So it starts going up the mountain, finds that out of shape, so has to come back down, works out at the gym for a couple of years, and goes back up the mountain, it's almost at the top, there's this huge snowstorm, gets blown off the mountain, comes back down, waits for a couple more years, goes up the mountain, finally gets to the top, talks to the wise person. And says, so what's the meaning of life, wise person? And the wise person says, the only wisdom on this mountain is the wisdom that you brought with you. Mm. Climbs back down, going through life again, a couple of years pass, decides 
needs to take this seriously. So decides to find a mountain and go off to the top of the mountain and meditate. Takes a little bit of time to find a mountain. Most of the mountains are occupied. Mount Everest is occupied, Machu Picchu occupied. Finally finds an empty mountain and sort of starts meditating, right? Year after year after year. He's not getting anywhere. He's not getting anywhere. So he comes back down the mountain and says, you know, forget this. And then he sees this tree. And he says, oh, okay, this is a sign. You know, the tree started off with this little tiny seed. Now it's this huge long tree. I gave up too quickly. I'm going to go back to the top of the mountain. Meditates for a few more years. Does, nothing happens. Nothing happens. So he's coming, he comes back down the mountain and he sees a river. And he says, oh, I get it now. You know, the river's been here year after year after year, wearing down the rock. Millennia have passed. I get it. He goes back up the mountain, meditates for a few more years. Nothing happens, comes back down again. This time, he's totally had it, right? He's totally, totally had it. He sees like this dog by the side of the road, and the dog is unhappy because there's this flea on the dog, like sucking the blood from the dog, right? And so he says, I'm gonna help the dog, right? So he's reaching to like pluck off the, the flea, right? Reaching to pluck off the flea. And he just as, as he's about to pluck off the flea from the dog, he says, well, I'm going to help the dog, but I'm not going to be helping the flea. The flea is going to be unhappy. Right? The flea is like super happy. Right? <laughs> and so he thinks about it, and he says, oh, okay, I'm going to get this like piece of rotting meat, and I'm going to take the flea from the dog and put it on the rotting meat. Okay? So he's about to get the flea from the dog, and he says, well, wait a second, you know, the flea is happy on the dog, will be happy on the body meat, but like how about in between? Like in between, the flea won't be happy because it won't have anything to eat. <laughs> so <laughs> I've not seen that much about a flea. <laughs> so thinks about it some more and decides to offer his tongue to the flea. So the, thing, yeah, the plan is that, you know, he's going to go up to the dog, he's going to offer his tongue to the flea, the flea's going to get on the tongue, and then he's going to go to the rotting meat, and then the flea's going to go off from the rotting meat to the, the tongue to the rotting meat. Is that clear? So everyone will be happy, right? It's a great thing. Everyone will be happy. That's what we ate before. What? So, you just have to visualize this, right? He's approaching the dog, right? He's about to stick out, he's sticking out his tongue, right? And the flea says, oh, what a juicy tongue. And it's like walking towards the tongue, right? And the second that the flea's leg hits the tongue, the guy has instant enlightenment. And one day he's walking along and he hears someone say, help me, help me, I've fallen into a hole. So my name is Michael Dalamatha. We're gonna be talking about <laughs> culture first, agile transformations. This is just a little bit of an introduction to me. I've been an agile coach for about 10 years. And we're gonna start off here with a little bit of an example, a little bit of an example. So I'd like you guys to get into two groups and just line up, two equal size groups, and just like line up in a row here. So 
Uh, the task is going to be that you're going to alphabetize yourselves by first name. So A is going to be up front. Like oh, in the middle. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 don't be bad. You must be a manager. Uh, she managed, she managed this yeah. 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 Okay, so the difference is that this group over here to the right is going to be self organizing. Okay, whereas this group is going to have a manager. Oh, who wants to be the manager? Great. Okay, you want to be the manager, the guy who looks exactly like me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And here's the deal with you. So the manager is the only person who can like talk to you. You guys can't talk to each other, right? And you guys can't move each other either. Okay. So he's gonna ask you your name. He's gonna move you to the right location. Right? All right. Okay. And you guys self-organize. Okay. And we have, wait, wait, okay. but we haven't started. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's listening she always wants to win. She always wants to win. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you're done, you raise your hand. Okay? Right. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, Okay, so what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the story? 
What? Self-organizing is more efficient. Self-organizing is more efficient, okay? What else? We shouldn't pay a manager more than employee. Don't pay a manager more than employee. <laughs> <laughs> Let people talk. Sorry? Let people talk to each other. Let people talk to each other, yeah. Empower yeah. your people. Empower your people, yeah, yeah. It's the Republicans that screwed up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, he said he spoke about my final life. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Um, so, um, a few things to add to that. So, one is that it's not the people, right? It's the structure. Yeah, right? So, Deming says 94% of the problems are system problems, and the system is the responsibility of management. Right? So, um, a standard thing is that there's something that's going poorly. Some senior manager says, well, we need to blame someone. They blame Anne. They remove Anne and they put in Jose, and it still goes poorly, so they blame Jose, right? So people just get burned. And then over here on the side, there's like some smart person who says, oh, I'm not going to join that because that's a total mess up, right? And then this thing blows up, everyone gets, what is that when you get, it's like, exceeds expectations, meets expectations, does not meet expectations? Is that right? What? No. Below expectations. Okay, so all these people get below expectations, right? The person over here who's unhelpful but avoided the problem gets promoted. Yeah. <laughs> and so then that's how you know companies end, right? And so the, the issue there, right, is blaming the person instead of understanding that it's a structural problem. Right? So you fix the structure and then the problem improves, right? So you, as you saw here, right? Right, we got the same people, we changed the structure, we got a radical improvement in performance. Okay. So if you understand that, you understand something that like 90% of agile coaches and managers don't really understand. So you really like understand that fundamentally in your bones. Okay. You understand something that almost no one understands. And so one thing I invite you to do is to put on your structure goggles, or your operating model goggles, and just see that everywhere, right? See structure, operating model everywhere. Okay. So like if you're waiting in line for something, you can just think to yourself, you know, what structure would allow me not to wait in line? Right? If you're on an elevator and it goes to like four, two, five, three, one, six, before it finally goes to your floor, you can think, what structure would improve? Right? And the improvements are not small. The improvements actually increase the more complex the problem is. So you saw here, this is a simple problem, right? Alphabetizing, it's a simple problem. And we saw, you know, a factor of two or three or four or five improvement between a not so great structure and a good structure. And so the, the improvements are even greater when the problem is more complex, okay? So think about it as a structural problem, okay? And think about what is the best structure for this particular problem. And so, one way to think about an organization or a company is that it's this constant search for a better, better structure. And so why is it a constant search? Because the situation is changing. Right? The external situation is changing and the internal situation is changing, right? The external situation is the economy, competitors, technology, right? So when something changes, right, the optimal internal structure could change, right, in response to that. Right, and the same thing goes for internal change. Right, so there's an internal change, hire a bunch of people, blah, 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 right? Then the internal, optimal internal structure might change. Right? So that's why it's a constant search. Right? Sometimes you hear this statement like, agile is this like journey, it's not a destination. And it seems somewhat abstract. But this is a, like a very concrete way to see that it's actually not abstract. It's like this very physical thing that you're actually doing. Right? Actually changing the operating model, the structure of the organization, right? So operating model, just means how the sausage is made, okay? That's what that means, right? So imagine that there are two sausage manufacturers, right? And they have the same business model, right? So the cost is the same, the way they sell it is the same, the product strategy is the same, pricing is the same, everything is the same, distribution is the same, right? But the way they make the sausage is different, right? So one of them has like an assembly line with like specialists in like the casing of the sausage to build it. The other ones have just these like all around people, right, who build the entire sausage by themselves, right? So two different operating models, right? But everything else is the same, right? And so you can just ask yourself, what is the best operating model, right? 
So the input and outputs are the same. Everything else is the same, but the operating model is different, right? So one very simple concrete example of this is McDonald's versus Subway. So they both make more or less the same thing, right? Like a sandwich, but they do it in radically different ways, right? So when you go to a McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, what happens? Put it in the microwave. Right. Okay, yeah, so it goes off somewhere, right, and then the sandwich appears, right? Okay, so that's one operating model. And what happens when you go to Subway? Sorry? You're right, it's, they make the sandwich in front of you, and like you make every choice, right? Like you say, here's the bread I want, here's the meat I want, here's the cheese I want, and I'll give you more salad, right? So those are two different operating models, right? But everything else is the same, right? Like the product is the same, the size of the shop is the same, the people are the same, right? But two different, radically different operating models, okay? And they have different results, okay? So just think about that. You're constantly, constantly thinking about different operating models, right? And so when you understand that, then you see that Scrum is not anything particularly special, right? It's just a team level operating model. At least a chunk of it is just a team level operating model. Right? It's just like a point in this space. And like you could do Scrum today, you could stop doing Scrum because it's not the best operating model, and you could do Scrum at some other time because it becomes the best operating model. But it's just an operating model, a team level operating model. It has other stuff like values, which we'll talk about, right? But it's not a privileged thing, right? Like you can invent your own operating model, you can name it, and you can write a book about it, right? It's not a special thing. So it's just a way of organizing a team. And what you should always be thinking about is like, what's the optimal best way to um, organize teams, teams of teams, blah, 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 right? In order to improve the outcome. Any questions on that? Okay, great. So if you understand that, as I say, you understand much more than the typical agile coach or, or manager understands, okay? Now, the next thing to understand is that culture restricts the operating model or the structure that you can. Okay. So you would like to be able to just implement any operating model like that, but culture actually restricts it. Okay. So if we look at these two teams, right, the team with a boss and the team that's autonomous, what might be some words that you would use to describe the culture of the team with a boss? Hierarchical. Yeah. What else? Bureaucratic. Bureaucratic, rigid, yeah. Vulnerable. Vulnerable. Yeah. And what are some words that you might use to describe the autonomous team? Self-organizing. Self-organizing. Efficient. Efficient. Empowering. 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 Cross-functional. Sorry? Cross-functional. Cross-functional. Yeah. Okay, great. And so one of the big mistakes that companies make is that they see some agile organization. And what you see is the operating model more or less, you see roles, you see meetings, stuff like that, but you don't see the culture. Mm -hmm. And so they'll send people off to like some training and they'll say, well, obviously autonomous teams are better. And they'll try to snap to it. Like they go to the training on Thursday and Friday, and then on Monday they say, oh, you're autonomous. <laughs> okay? But what has happened is that they still have the old structure. They still have the old um, culture, excuse me. And so since this new structure, right, the autonomous team requires a different culture, it fails, right? So they're trying to build an autonomous team inside of like, you know, fear-based waterfall command and control structure. And so the autonomous team fails, right? And since they don't see the culture, they blame something else. Like they blame the structure, or they blame the manager, or they blame the agile coach, or they blame the agile. They blame the scrum master. Okay, they blame the scrum master, right? And they like churn through different scrum masters, right? Like you see that all the time, like some company will be doing Agile for three years, and then they'll say, oh, now we're finally ready for it, or something like that, right? And so the key thing is that if you want to have a wide range of operating models to choose from, what you need to do is you need to first change the culture, and then change the operating models behind it, okay? You don't have to do that. You can always just optimize the operating model within your existing culture. You can do that. That's what management consulting companies do. Right, but that, you don't get the transformation that Agile promises. Because changing the culture just widens the set of operating models that you can actually implement. Okay? So then you do first. Okay. And so like another way of viewing this is something like, you know, companies start off with like scope, schedule, budget. 
then they discover that like projects that are delivered on time sometimes have zero value. <laughs> and sometimes projects that are late or off budget or off scope have lots of value. And then they say, okay, okay, let's focus on value. And then they discover that um, they can't determine value, the customer determines value. And so they wanna get to value as quickly as possible, which means fast customer feedback loops. Right? Which means something like speed, right? Let's get stuff out to the customer as quickly as possible. And then what they discover is that the way you get speed is by doing things like allowing people to communicate with each other, by increasing trust, by increasing safety. So then it becomes cultural, okay? But one thing you have to be very careful of as someone who now has had this epiphany and understands this, is that there's like a very natural thing to like go into an organization and say, let's do culture and leadership work first, mm -hmm. right? But there is this like sort of evolution that people need to go through and organizations need to go through. So like a, there's often a very often mismatch between like agile coaches and companies where like the agile coach shows up and says, let's talk about values and principles and culture. And the company is saying like, you know, can you just help me run like a meeting better or something, mm -hmm. right? And so you always have to be very respectful and empathetic to where they are. Right? And they may move or they may not move. And they may just stay in their culture and just fine tune their operating model, okay? So we've been talking a lot about culture, and I just want to introduce this simple culture model that's based on the work of um, Lalou in a book called Reinventing Organizations. This is a super, super simplified version of it. And if you want to read the full version of it, you can read the book. Um, so the, each type of culture has a color associated with it. So red is the culture of rules or bureaucracy. Right? So you get stopped by a cop says, you know, 25 miles an hour, or you say, there's no one on the street, I was going 30 miles an hour, what's a big deal, there's a rule, it doesn't matter, April 15th is tax season, whatever, right? Okay. That's the rule of bureaucracy. Okay. Orange is a performance-based culture, primarily around money, right? The goal is to make money, nothing else matters except to make money. So, like, it doesn't matter whether people are happy or not, it doesn't matter whether or not customers are happy or not. It doesn't matter whether or not the ocean is being burned or not. What matters is to optimize on money, right? Optimize on KPIs, optimize on OKRs. Hey, okay. green is family, right? So family means that we care about everyone, right? So we care about all of the actors in the system, right? So I have a family member, family member has lots of hair. I feel jealous <laughs> of the person. <laughs> yeah, in an orange performance-based model, I could like kick the person off, right? But since they're a family member, I stay connected, right? So everyone matters, right? No matter who they are, right? And so we care about money because we need to pay the rent, but we also pay about happiness. We also care about the environment, et cetera. Okay, and then TO is evolutionary systems, biological systems. Right? So where everything is in harmony and everything is balanced and everything is suited for a particular purpose. Okay, and so, Right now, we live in an orange world, primarily, and we can just test this. So if you think of a recent job, I'm just gonna ask you, was it mostly red, mostly orange, mostly green, or mostly teal? Mm -hmm. So if you think of your recent job, current job, how many people were in a mostly red environment? So we've got a, one, two, three people, four people. How many people were mostly in an orange environment? I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. How many people were in a green environment? One, two, okay. And how many people were in a teal environment? Okay, no one. Okay, so this, by the way, is something that you can do tomorrow, right, at work. You can, like, get a group of people and you can just say, you know, give one sentence on each one of these, right? So bureaucracy, performance, money, family, evolutionary system. And you can say, what kind of culture are we in now? You can also do that during an interview, right? and just to understand and sense the culture. And the cool thing about it is, is that you don't need to do some any sophisticated analysis. Just ask people in the organization what culture they experience. And the culture they experience is the culture that you're actually in. Just ask people. Okay, so the first question is, so what culture are you in now? The second question is, what culture would you like to be in? Okay, so how many people here would like to be in a red culture? No one. How many people would like to be in an orange culture? No one. How many people would like to be in a green culture? One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 
How many people would like to be in a teal culture? Okay. One of the boys, okay. So this is always the answer, right? It's always the case that almost everyone is red orange, and it's almost always the case that everyone wants to be in green teal, okay? So you can ask that question, and you can just show the results, right? Like you can like literally create a table, right? Which is like current and desired, right? And so like one technique is that if you have the ability to influence this in any way, shape, or form, right? Just know that if you're able to shift your group, right, the people that you are around you, from say orange to green, then everyone is going to want to be part of your group. Right? That's what you've just heard from everyone. Like literally everyone wants to be green teal, but everyone is red orange. So if you just get a reputation for being able to create green, right, then everyone is going to want to be in your group. So I'll teach you one way to do that. Shortly, okay. Now, a good question to ask is, why do we even care about this? Like, why don't we just stay orange? Why don't we just stay orange, keep optimizing on orange, and just keep making more and more money? Because people burn out. Sorry? Burn out people. Okay. People get burned out. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. You don't want people to be burned out? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other reasons? It's a good for company and art for people. Ah, okay. It's for the company now. Yeah, that's a weird thing. Like, so human beings created companies. Mm. And now we say we work for the company instead of the company works for us. Mm. Yeah. Something strange happened there, right? Okay. What else? Efficiency. Efficiency. What's more efficient? Uh, you can make it more organized. Make it roll better. Okay. Make it roll better. Okay. All right, so those are reasons to think about. It's always a question, right? It's always a question about whether or not you actually want to shift, right? So the first question you can ask is, where are we now? The second question you can ask is, where do we want to be? And the third question is, do you want to take responsibility? Okay, do you want to take responsibility, right? Like, you know the joke of like, you know, when you point at someone, three fingers are pointing at you, right? <laughs> So it's like really easy to say, right? Like if only management or if only the billionaires or something like that were green, I would be happier, right? But what, the only person we can change is ourselves. And so the question is what responsibility do we have, right? To shift ourselves, to shift ourselves from orange to green. Okay, and so that's the question and then that's the thing that you can decide to do or not. And um, I'll just mention a little bit about teal. And so teal is like nature. So the social intelligence of ants is a really good example of a teal system. And so what I really like about ants is that it's clear that they have very complex behavior, but they have extremely small brains. Like they have really small brains, like physically they're like super small. <laughs> so it's like unlikely that a Gantt chart fits in there, right? So like it's unlikely like there's like some Gantt chart that says here's where all of these ants are supposed to be, right? And yet it's this super robust, super agile system, right? Like if you step on an ant pile, right? Ant colony? What is this called? Ant hill. Ant hill. Okay, you said, okay, like within a few hours it'll reorganize, right? Like these little tiny ants with small brains somehow reorganize and back into an ant hill. And so compare that to your companies or your team. Like, you know, someone shows up late, that's a problem. Someone goes on vacation, that's a problem. So like big brains, extremely fragile system that breaks easily. Small brains, extremely robust system, right? The ants are like super happy and chill, right? <laughs> Do we know? Do we know? Do we they're know? working all the time. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, they're like perfectly suited for their jobs, right? Like they don't have to put on alarm clocks to wake up in the morning, nothing, right? So this is a, a teal system, right? So teal, like, they're like naturally doing what they want to do, right? So that's the thing. And so here's the picture when I talked about um, the culture restricting the structure, right? So it's not the case that there's like any particular culture that's better than the others. I don't want to be judgmental about it. It's just that you have more opportunities, right? More opportunities, right? And different approaches will be different, will be appropriate in different situations, right? So like if there is an earthquake, right? 
I don't want to say something like, oh, how do you feel about the fact that there's an earthquake, right? What we want is like Larry to be command and control because we assume he knows where the exit is. And he says, you know, go there, right? Which is like, you know, super red or something like that, right? So appropriate for the situation, but what we want is kind of wider scopes. And so when we're in red, we just have a smaller set of operating models to choose from, right? And so if we have a problem, right, the degrees of freedom that we have are smaller, right? With orange, it's greater, with green, it's greater, with yellow, it's greater, right? But in a teal organization, you'll find red stuff, orange stuff, green stuff, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? It's just that you have the ability to actually be teal, green, et cetera, but you don't have it on red, right? So you're much more adaptable, right? Like a set of events. And so you're able to switch a lot faster. Right? And when you switch a lot faster, then you are able to get more of what you need. Right? So that's just like the entire idea. That's the entire idea. Okay, so um, any comments or thoughts about that? Yes? I just wanted to ask, like, is this model taking into account the situation that the company is in? Because I immediately thought of, like, there are companies who are, when times are good, seem like they are green. Yeah. But as soon as stuff is not going so well, they become red. Yeah. Or orange, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, the, so that, so first of all, that definitely happens. Right? And then the, the question is, what is it that you are actually wanting to be? And like, that's literally just the question. Like, what is it that you are actually wanting to be? And so it's very easy when you're feeling very rich, right? To say, oh, you know, we really care about employee happiness, right? And then when you're getting crushed, to say, oh, no, you know, we're going to cut salaries and lay off people, right? So that's very easy. And then it's very clear that what you're doing here is just optimizing for profit, right? So like we care about people provided that caring about people makes us money, yeah. right? So then it's a means to an end, not an end to itself, right? So here, what we're saying is that this is actually the end in and of itself, mm -hmm. right? So like, you know, I, I'm sitting at the dining room table, you know, at the family and there's like this cake that I really like and I have the power to take the cake and just eat it all myself. Like that would be orange, right? Optimizing, right? But because I care about other people, right? I take a slice of the cake, right? So that other people can have it as well. Right? So that's like the entire thing. Did Teal, is it the ants get to it? And Teal is it the ants get to it, okay. right? So that's the entire thing of whether or not you care about these other apps. Right? So another way of saying this is that like orange is the world of more. Right? So you're like perpetually dissatisfied. And green is the world of enough. Right? So in the world of orange, you know you want companies to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and groups to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and advance and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we live in a closed system. Earth is a closed system. So it, it like it's nonsensical, right? Like all the companies want to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a closed system. It's impossible. You know, uncontrolled growth in a closed system is just a cancer, right? And even if you look at it as a, in a sector, right? Like, so what happens if like one company wins and the other company loses, right? At that level of society, no change has happened, right? So like, you know, you have a friend that works at a competitor company. You know Scrum better, so you win and your friend loses their job, right? So that's the world of orange, right? And you're constantly just caring about that. Um, another beautiful example of this is something like gender equality. So every once in a while you'll see some study and say, so the reason why you want to include women in a group is that you make more money. Right? So that's the means, right? You've all seen these, right? Like get more diverse decisions, get better decision making. The problem with that is what happens if there's a scientific study that says that if you include women, you make less money? Right? So if you have means justifies the end, right, you're always just in this structure. You're always just in this structure. Right? So like caring equally literally means caring equally. Right? That means like so so it's really about what the definition of value is. So you're literally saying I value caring about people, or I value caring about the environment as much as I value caring about profit. And so that means I'm willing to take lower profits in order not to dump garbage into the ocean. Like, like that is the shift, right? 
right? And the second you're bailing out on that, right, you're back in the Okay, yeah? How do you um, see if company is actually operating in field mode? Oh yeah, so there are like apparently 20 or 30 or 40 examples in the history of the world. Anything you personally Yeah. Anything you personally just need to work for? Yeah, so I'm part of a group that's teal-ish. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, so the reason why it's so incredibly difficult, right, is that you're surrounded by knowledge. Right. So that's what make, that's what makes it so incredibly difficult, right? So just going back to this initial question, right? I asked all of you, right, where do you want to be? Green teal. All of you want to be in it. Almost all of you are red orange. So how's that possible? How's that possible that everyone wants to be green teal? instead of that one. What? The system's built for it. Right, exactly. So the whole thing is like optimizing push and thing, right? To do that, right? Like, so like money itself atomizes and suffers us, right? You know, so we believe things like um, no matter how much money you have, you, you should work hard to get, have more money. Right? Like we all believe that, right? more or less. Right? At some level, right? Like that's why billionaires still want to make more money no matter how much money they have. Um, we believe um, if you don't have money, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. right? We believe that um, if you have money, it's 100% something that you did. So it's your money, no one else's. Right? So the whole thing is structured around you know, this extreme gravitation. Um, to get to that point, right? Extreme gravitational force. So, it's, so that's why I say teal ish, right? So, like, this group has an interface, right? Has an interface, right, to the world, which is purely orange. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, it's a question of are we able to be still, right, and achieve inner peace, right, in order to be in that state, right? So, that's why you have to be at the mountain for like for years and years and years of meditation, mm -hmm. right, to achieve that state. Okay, and so now I, I do want to give a, like this very concrete way um, to work with yourself and with other people um, to shift um, the culture, right? So culture, to a very large degree, just means what our inner, in, internal state of growth is, personal growth, personal awareness is, how much we care about other people, how much we respect other people. And so if we change ourselves, we change the culture in the organization, okay? And so, Previously, I mentioned that it's very hard just to go in one step from here to here, right? From orange to green. And so a lot of companies fail in doing that because they don't understand that fully. And so here are some baby steps that get you from do this or tell me what to do, right? Boss says to do this, team says tell me what to do, all the way up to here, what have you been doing that and doing this, right? So this is from David Marquette, a book called Turn the Ship Around. It's called The Ladder of Leadership or The Leadership Ladder. And so you start off with like, do this, tell me what to do, right? Standard command and control, right? You do this task, you do this task, tell me when you're done, I'll give you another task, right? And then level two is, what do you see? Right, so what you're doing now is everyone has eyes, everyone has senses, right? So if you have a 10 person group, the manager goes from seeing what they see to seeing what they see plus seeing what 10 other people see. So they're more capable and they're including more of other people. Level three is what you think. So now it's not just the eyeballs, but it's also the brain that you're getting, getting the input from other people, right? What would you like to do? Now you're asking the person to take everything into account and say, here's the direction I want to go in. Level five, what do you intend to do? Now you're asking about the entire system. So the person's concerning not just themselves, but everyone else. And so here you're starting off with this very um, egocentric state. So what do you see? What do you think? What would you like to do? And now you're asking and shifting, right? To now include the entire system. And now finally in level six, you move to something like autonomy. What have you done? So the team or the person has gone off and done something and is now just informing the boss, right? And then now what have you been doing? Now they're doing a whole bunch of things on their own, right? And the benefit of this, you know, for the boss is that if they're not having to micromanage, they can go off and like start an office and shift or something like that, right? They can go off and do other things. And typically what you'll do here is that you'll just start by noticing. So don't start by like putting any effort into this. This should be easy. And right? if you're pushing, then you're not um, 
you're not taking care of yourself probably. So just start off by like observing your leadership style. Like with this person I'm leadership level one, with that person I'm leadership level four, when I haven't slept I'm this leadership level. And just start noticing. And like you know, day after day after day you'll notice your patterns. Like this takes five seconds after a conversation. And you'll just start becoming used to it. It's like, oh, this is leadership three, leadership four, leadership five, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll become like a connoisseur of, of leadership styles, right? Just like you're drinking wine, initially all the wine tastes the same, and you get this like sophisticated palate. So this, yeah. The second thing that will happen is that you'll start noticing other people's leadership styles. So you like you'll be able to walk into a room, and in ten minutes you'll be able to say, oh, this person's leadership style this, leadership. And then you really start winning, right? Because now you can actually navigate the world, right? Because now you have this like very context-sensitive understanding of leadership styles. And then the final thing is just to invite shifts in leadership, right? So if you have a boss that's level one and saying to do this, you might say something like, oh yeah, I will have to be happy to do that. Do you mind if I tell you what I see? So you now you're inviting a leadership problem. And so you shift the leadership in your organization and then you shift the culture by doing that. So that's the it's very simple equation. And so if you start off by sort of doing this, then your agile transformation will work a lot better, typically. Right? Because you start off with this, and typically we do something like four to six weeks of leadership culture work. And then you send off everyone to two days of scrum training, and they learn the operating model. And now the operating model is a lot easier than if you were in reverse. Right? The normal thing to do is to spend you know, 18 months trying to implement some operating model that you can't do because your culture doesn't support that operating model. And you get frustrated, fire a lot of people, blame a lot of people, and then maybe, 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 maybe you figure out that you have a And by that time, you're probably sobering down because your company is toast. So like four to six weeks of culture and leadership work first, then paves the way for a shift in operating. And at that point, you can like pick any operating model you want because you have this much wider scope of operating models that are more in the organization. All right, so that's what I wanted to tell you guys. Um, I want to thank Michael Sahoda. He's the one who put all these ideas together. I want to thank Maria and Larry for inviting me in here. And feel free to reach out to me. It's really good, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, have you heard these ideas before?